while while we wait, uh, we have two guests today. Uh, one of them is online, uh, Alicia Barcena, the Executive Secretary of the Economic uh, Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, or CEPAL if you prefer. And uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. And, uh, oh wait, I see Guy Ryder is also on. Uh, 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 Ms. Ryder, can, can you hear us? Yes, I can, absolutely. Sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, oh no problem. Uh, so, uh, uh, and so uh, Guy Ryder from the, the, the head of the International Labor Organization is also on. Uh, uh, please, uh, either one of you can uh, go first and then we'll take uh, your remarks and then turn over the floor to questions. Alicia, <laughs> adelante. Okay, thank you okay. so much. Well, the first thing I want to say is that this has been a wonderful morning. I want to congratulate Guy, Guy Ryder and, of course, the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General, because today we were launching a very important report that has basically, I think, a couple of, of proposals. And the first one I say is the call to action. We need, and that's what happened today, with the leaders that participated, with the, with the World Bank, with the IMF, with the international financial institutions, with prime ministers and presidents and ministers and, 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 and people from the private sector, representatives from civil society. The idea is a call for action and to accelerate the creation of jobs and extend social protection. And this has been done under the leadership of ILO, and I want to thank most especially ILO, and the idea is to have a global accelerator on jobs and social protection. And the idea is to create 400 million jobs. That's what we are looking for. And to extend social protection coverage at least to 4 billion people. And, and we are talking about doing this by 2030, by the way. And why is this so important? Because there is growing inequalities and asymmetries between the developed and developing countries in terms of vaccines, of wealth, of financing, and we are confronting a divergent recovery. And, and we have to say nearly 85% of the government spending to mitigate the, the crisis and, and, to, and for the recovery are coming from advanced economies. Developing countries are having a lot of problems because they have less fiscal space, they are highly indebted. And I also want to raise the voice of the middle income countries who are the most critical ones. And, and we have to say the wealth of billionaires have increased over $3.9 trillion between March and December 2020. This is what the, the report is showing very much. Let me turn quickly to the proposals because I think this is what we need and because the policy brief is talking about, of course, the call for action for job creation and how to move to green sectors, universal social protection and a just transition. But how are we going to fund this, you know? I think this is the major question, and that's where I want to come in and, and say, what are the, 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 first of all, how do we forge new social and fiscal compacts that include a new economic paradigm? But the first thing we need to do is to have the funding to do this. So let me put forward the proposals that were discussed today during the morning, and that we in ECLAC have been working forcefully on them. First of all, expansion and redistribution of liquidity from developed to developing countries and support concessional funding for low middle income countries with proposals such as FASE, the proposal from Costa Rica. Uh, secondly, the new issuance of special drawing rights should be accompanied by voluntary recycling of unused SDRs. Listen, the developed countries don't need reserves, they have them. So the use of SDRs is, is so important for us. And what we need is to see if these SDRs and could be recycling these SDRs through a middle-income country trust funds where development banks and regional financial institutions can participate. And of course, we need a new trust fund to support middle-income countries. That's what we are advocating for, including the Caribbean countries in my case, but small island development states that should be debt, they should go for debt alleviation to create resilience funds. And, and, and finally, I would say we need an institutional reform on the multilateral debt architecture. We need a, an establishment of a multilateral credit agency innovative instruments to increase debt repayment capabilities of developing countries such as hurricane income linked bonds and to integrate liquidity and debt reduction measures that could be, I, I would say, available for countries. What we need is funding 
And of course, we need to orient this funding where we need to go. And for us, tackling, for example, tax avoidance and illicit financial flows is another of a very high priority. And of course, to expand the multinational companies' uh, corporate tax of 15% to all developing countries. All of this is embodied in a new social compact. And I want to say, going Guy Ryder, it has been a privilege to be here with you because you have been the very first to suggest this social uh, floor for everyone. And I think it's, the time is now and we need to move quickly towards that. Thank you so much. Ryder, uh, some, some, some uh, remarks from you as well. Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, I can benefit from following on from what Alicia has already uh, told you all, and provide a little bit of context, perhaps. The, uh, uh, at the meeting on jobs and social protection and for poverty eradication and a sustainable recovery, which has just concluded, as Alicia has explained, the Secretary General has, uh, amongst other things, launched a proposal for a global accelerator uh, for, for jobs and social protection. And this falls within the context of the Financing for Development initiative launched by Secretary General Guterres with the Prime Ministers of Canada and Jamaica in, in 2020. And you know, what we're responding to here is something which should not go unnoticed in the context of this pandemic. Uh, this health emergency has generated the, the biggest economic and social crisis, and I would say development crisis, in, uh, in the memory of any of us. Um, the impact uh, in economic and social terms has been four times more severe than what we lived through in the great financial uh, meltdown of 2008, 2009. And so what do we face now? Uh, we face a situation in which, yes, the global economy appears to be on a trajectory of renewed growth. We know that the aggregate figures look quite encouraging, uh, up to 6% growth uh, in, the, in this year. But, as the Secretary General has said, the reality is that the global economy and our societies are on a trajectory that he characterizes as one of great divergence. This is to say that because they have access to vaccinations in greater, with greater facility, because they have the fiscal firepower, as uh, Alethea has just explained, the advanced economies, the richer world, is bouncing back relatively, I use the word relatively, quickly. The same is not true of the developing and the emerging economies who are stuck in a, a double whammy, if you like, lack of access to vaccinations, lack of the type of fiscal space that could enable them to um, resume growth and development processes. And within this rather alarming prospect, a prospect which should alarm us at least, uh, today we have pointed to two key areas. One, uh, of course, is a question of jobs and Yes, 400 million jobs that are needed uh, to put us on track to meet the 2030 agenda uh, and to uh, bring about decent work for all. Uh, and secondly, uh, the issue of social protection. You know, the social costs, the human costs, let me say, of this pandemic have been immensely magnified by the fact that the majority of the global population today is not covered by social protection of any type whatsoever. That applies to 53% of our fellow human beings. You know, and if we're talking seriously about resilience, building back better, that is a status quo and a reality that simply cannot be allowed to, uh, to continue. So our accelerator is a mechanism to mobilize resources and channel resources uh, to provide, as Alicia has explained, basic social protection flaws to all and at the same time to create jobs. Now, I think there are two pieces to that challenge. One is getting the right policies, getting the right mechanisms in place. The other, as Alicia has so eloquently said, is getting the financing. Now, uh, this will, it's an investment, but it needs the resources to make it work. And at first sight, of course, the sums look um, very, uh, very formidable indeed. Uh, and yet we have, as, as has been explained, we have the opportunity and the possibility to mobilize those funds. We have the uh, recent allocation of uh, special drawing rights by the IMF. The challenge now is to channel those uh, funds from where they've gone, as has been explained, to the countries who least need them. 
to the countries and to the purposes where they are so very badly needed. And then we can look at international fiscal policies, the question of the global uh, corporate taxation. We can look at plugging the holes through which illicit financial flows tend to pass. We need to fix all of these things. But if you look at what has already been spent very unequally around the world, it is true, on a COVID-19 response that adds up to some 16 trillion US dollars, uh, it is not beyond our capacities and is certainly within our responsibilities uh, to provide the necessary finance to reach the uh, very important and pressing goals that are addressed in the, uh, uh, in the global accelerator that the, uh, the Secretary General has launched today. I am encouraged, uh, and here I echo Alicia again, you know, that we had a meeting today when not only presidents and prime ministers were speaking with a single voice, a single voice about the imperatives before us, but we had the managing director of the IMF, we had the president of the World Bank, we had the leaders of the regional development banks and others all joining their voice and I think joining with common purpose in this extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily important challenge uh, that lies before us. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our uh, speakers for their for their presentations, and now I'll open up uh, the floor for questions. Uh, please uh, identify yourselves uh, to our speakers as 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 uh, you get called on. Um, anyone in the room? Yes, Abdul Hamid. Uh, thank you. My name is Abdul Hamid. I am from the Arabic Daily Al Quds Al Arabi. My question is about uh, Venezuela from Latin America, and what is the ECLA doing uh, to elevate the sufferings of the Venezuelan people? Do they see the country as sinking more deeper into recession, or there is hope that it is recovering? Thank you. Uh, hold on. We, uh, Ms. Barsana, uh, question, questions for you. Uh, we, we can't quite hear you just yet. One second. Do we have Ron? Uh, uh, please go okay. ahead. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, we have you now. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you. Well, first of all, I have to say that Latin America and the Caribbean has been the developing country most hardly hit by the pandemics, with 8.4 percent of the world population and 32.2 percent of deaths. That's that's the amount of the of the problem. And we have been the largest contraction in terms of, of jobs has been in our region and has been terrible. And we have an, an unemployment of 9%. And the world average is 3.5%. So it's the sharpest job losses uh, in, in the world. We have lost 25 million jobs, of which 13 have been women. So when you're asking us, what are we doing with this? Well, in fact, we are per talking to the, to the governments, basically, to the, to the heads of state, to tell them that paradoxically economic recovery expected in 2021 is going to be 5.9, but that will be insufficient to restore economic activity and employment to the pre-crisis. They need to develop a recovery plans that have engines of growth beyond private consumption and exports of raw materials because our region is not prepared to do that and we have to do that because otherwise we will not be able to move from the emergency to the recovery. We are proposing, and, and, and this has been taken off, a, 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 an emergency basic income equivalent to one line of poverty that should remain for the rest of the year. And this is important because in the region, 32 countries have adopted 263 emergency social protection measures with cash and in-kind transfers that we have been able to develop, design, and proposed to the member states, and of course they have been using some of these ideas. And the second thing is how to move towards a digital inclusion, universal digital inclusion. We have 66.2 million households without internet connection. That has affected 167 million students unable to attend schools. And the most affected are women and youth. So one of the things we are suggesting is the formalization of companies and extension of social protection floors to workers in the informal economy, which is the most high, highly, highly hit. And finally, we need to increase 10 percentage points of public and private investment 
because now investment in the region is 17.6%, while the average in the world is 26%. So we really need to move quickly. Now, what is the urgency in our region is vaccines, because we have a growing asymmetry between, for example, Uruguay and Chile, who have reached 80% of the population fully vaccinated over 18 years old, but we have 80 with 0.2% of people vaccinated. That's the level of asymmetry that we are facing today. Guatemala, Honduras do not have access to vaccines, and they are the ones migrating. So we are calling for the U.S., for example, to provide the excess of their vaccines to these, to the, the you know, the excessive of vaccines they have to really move them to our region because this is going to be uh, very, very important. And again, in our region, the most important thing is progressive taxation. We have countries that have very low taxes, tax burden. We have to move into that. And of course, to tackle tax avoidance, with, you know, in Latin America and the Caribbean, tax avoidance, tax evasion is of 6.1% of GDP, $225 billion a year. That's important. That's, that's uh, you know, untainable. And illicit funding is also have reached $85 billion, which is 1.6% of GDP, which is basically because the product manipulation of international trade in goods and services. So, Coming back to your question, what we are asking for is debt alleviation for the Caribbean countries to the amount of 12% of the total debt for the creation of Caribbean Resilience Fund, and of course, access to, uh, and, and of course, to curb the tax evasion and fin illicit financial flows. Great. Th th thanks very much for that answer. Um, are there any further questions? Anyone, uh, anyone online? If you have something, please, please raise your hand, and you can begin. If not, I would, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank our guests. Uh, thank you uh, also, in particular, for taking uh, time off from the meeting that just uh, was wrapping up right now to to, to uh, make yourself available to the press. Th thanks very, very much, and have a have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks. It's a Bye. pleasure to join you. Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure Bye -bye. to see you. Bye.